YouTube and I'm going to let everyone in. and I'm going to let everyone in. All right, hello everyone and welcome to this week's seminar. Um, today we are starting our first set of early career seminars, which we will be having at the beginning of every month, the first Monday of every month this year. Uh, we, will be we will be having two early career seminars every Monday. And today starting us off is Leon Oliver from the University of Alberta, and he'll be talking about space radiation, how bad it can get. And Riley Troyer from the University of Iowa, who will be talking about substorm activity as a driver of energetic pulsating aurora. So Ian, if you would like to introduce Leon today, and Leon, if you would like to take the screen, uh, we can begin. Oh, sorry, I will remind everyone to be courteous and polite. Uh, please stay on mute, uh, ask questions in chat, and we'll get to questions at the end of each seminar. Okay, great, thank you, Kyle. Um, you guys can hear me okay? So it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Leon Olifer. Um, so Leon's a PhD student at the University of Alberta, uh, working with myself, but also with a number of other colleagues from um, institutions uh, in, in Canada and across the United States. And some of the people on this call may already have uh, either collaborated with Leon or had the opportunity to chat with him at, at various meetings. And so um, I, if I was one message, I would say and I encourage you to, to, to take the opportunity to chat to Leon when you come across him in, in the future. Uh, he's going to talk today about space radiation, how bad uh, can it get. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, so Leon did his uh, Bachelor of Science at Kiev Polytechnical Institute in applied physics between 2013 and 2017. Then he moved to the University of Alberta and did a master's in space physics uh, between 2017 and 2019 and uh, managed to finish that up with a number of publications in only 16 months. So that's um, to, to his uh, credit, I would say. Then he started a PhD program, um, also in space physics at the U of A. And he's almost finished that program now, actually. And he's expecting to defend his PhD thesis um, this coming summer in 2022. Just a few words uh, about his research. Um, he's published a number of papers quickly established himself as an important contributor, in my view, to radiation belt science. And he's studied a number of topics, large scale dynamics of some of the fastest changes of the belt have been a common focus of Leon's papers. He's been looking at intense ULF waves, um, investigating the importance of the last closed drift shell for very fast losses. And most recently is working on data from the GPS constellation to try to probe these, um, how to say short temporal and spatial scale um, dynamics. Today, he's gonna to talk about uh, what I would say is some of his most important work, I think. Um, and he's investigating this idea developed by Kennel and Petchek uh, more than 50 years ago that there might be an absolute limit to space uh, radiation. Um, he'll tell you all about it, but uh, maybe by the end of his talk, he'll have convinced you that um, that the importance of the kennel pet check limit for, for the belts is significant with potentially important consequences. He's won best student presentations in Canada at the Division of Atmospheric and Space Physics and was awarded an outstanding student presentation award at the 4AGU in 2020. He has a number of scholarships, an Alberta Graduate Excellence Scholarship, and most recently a Vela Fellowship, which enabled him to participate in the Los Alamos um, Summer School last summer. He also won a Graduate Teaching Award in, in 2019. So today he's going to ask the question and hopefully answer it, uh, space radiation, how bad can it get? Take it away, Leon. 
All right. Thank you, Ian. And uh, hi, everyone. My name is Leon. And as Ian just said, I'm a PhD student at the University of Alberta, and it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, for my today's talk, I will be discussing a portion of my PhD thesis where I will answer a very straightforward question, how bad can space radiation get? And I will do this in a rather convoluted way. So while the term space radiation is quite broad, for today's talk, I will be focusing on discussing electron radiation, which is trapped in the Van Allen radiation belt. This image schematically shows the configuration of the belts around the Earth, and it is an extremely variable and hazardous population that can critically damage any space-based infrastructure that orbits there for a long time. So to design any radiation hard satellite, one has to know what is the maximum what is the worst case scenario radiation levels around our planet that we can expect? And we will try to figure it out today. In particular, I will discuss whether there is even such a thing as a maximum level of the radiation uh, in the uh, radiation belts. Uh, and if there is, how often is it reached? What physical processes cause this limit to appear and what portion of the radiation belt electrons are affected by it? And I will answer all these questions one by one by statistically analyzing radiation ball dynamics during geomagnetic storms, as well as looking into the most intense ones. I should also probably advertise that the majority of these results are taken from my recent, uh, from our recent GRL paper, so feel free to look it up if you want some more details on the study. So, as I mentioned before, the Van Allen belts are extremely variable. This image taken from a recent wrapped instrument paper very nicely outlines this characteristic of the belt. Each panel here shows a 1.8 MeV electron flux as measured by the Van Allen probes during their seven year mission as a function of time on the X axis and the L shell, uh, which is equivalent to the distance from the Earth. Here, color means the intensity of the flux at a particular time and location. And as you can see from this image, the relativistic electron population varies by multiple orders of magnitude over this period. Moreover, the belt behavior during the storm is also quite, quite variable. There are times when the belts are rapidly depleted only to get enhanced above the pre-storm levels, creating an even harsher radiation conditions than they were before the storm. There are, of course, also times when the radiation belt losses result in essentially empty belt that stays like this for months. So the main question right now is how exactly can we compare and analyze the information from these different geomagnetic storms to figure out some typical belt behavior? Well, we can use a very handy statistical method called the superposed epoch analysis to answer that. And we will start with determining what constitutes an event for a geomagnetic storm that we are interested in. For this study, we focus on isolated geomagnetic storms with DST index less than minus 50 nanotesla. So all storms of at least moderate intensity. As well as to make the analysis clear, we are interested in storms with only one main phase and only one recovery phase. So DST has only one substantial drop and only one increase. An example of such storm is the October 2012 event, where the DST index from which is shown on the plot uh, on the slide. However, there are multiple events that can fit our selected criteria. For the Van Allen probe era, that is from uh, middle 2012 to uh, middle 2019, we were able to find 70 of them. Now we can suppose these events with respect to the minimum DSD index in each of the storms, align them all together, and even calculate the typical DSD index over the selected ensemble. The, pl the plot of the median DSD index, as well as uh, some mean and quartiles, is shown at the bottom of the slide, where we can see that the minimum mean DSD index is about minus 65 nanotesla. And on average, we indeed see a very clear separation between the main phase with decreasing DSD and the recovery phase with an increasing DSD. Now, I should mention that the x-axis of this plot has changed. Now, it's not just a date, but a superposed epoch time with the minimum DSD index being the selected zero. So all these analyses that we will carry on from now on will be performed using this zero as a reference point. And at this moment, we have selected the events based purely on the DSD dynamics during those storms and got the typical DSD behavior in them. However, we can repeat this whole analysis for these selected storms and look at some other quantities, for example, a radiation belt dynamics. The right set of plots shows a 1.8 MeV flux measured by the Van Allen probes over the course of these 70 storms. It also shows the median response uh, that we get from the superposition. 
So while we see a very clear dropout and recovery occurring in the superposed epoch median flux plot at the bottom, we actually incorporate geomagnetic storms with quite different dynamics. For example, in our statistics, we do have storms that contain very substantial acceleration of the relativistic electrons to above the pre-storm levels, as well as the events that are dominated by dropouts, like the one, like the second one, which is kind of poking out in the schematic. So overall, we can now investigate the typical radiation belt dynamics and repeat this whole superposed epoch analysis for other energy channels available from the Benalan probes. And this slide actually shows a summary of our analysis with the median and mean solar wind conditions and geomagnetic indices shown on the left and the median radiation belt response shown on the right. From the solar wind conditions, we can see that we're indeed looking at the geomagnetic storm with a very pronounced main phase that starts at about half a day before the zero epoch uh, and a single recovery phase that lasts for about two to three days. The radiation belt data reveals uh, on their own a very interesting dynamics of the electrons during the storms. The flux of the lower energy electrons, about a few hundred kilo electron volts, is rapidly enhanced during the main phase of the storm, as it is illustrated at the second panel on the right. It appears that the fluxes at those energies reach levels about two orders of magnitude higher than the pre-storm levels, and that is happening very quickly. The high energy electrons in a few thousand kilo electron volts are at first lost uh, by a few orders of magnitude during the main phase prior to their recovery that reaches about the same level as it was during the pre-storm conditions. So let's investigate this duality, this difference in the radiation belt response uh, for these two energy channels in a bit more detail. These plots show the median electron flux at fixed L star of 4.25, so the heart of the radiation belt, and the energy that we just got from our previous superposed epoch uh, plots. Those are 168 kilo electron volts on the left and 1.8 MeV on the right. Yet again, we see that the lower energy electrons are quickly accelerated and the higher energies are lost and then recovered. However, these black dots are just median flux values that we got from our analysis that contains the information of 70 geomagnetic storms. So in addition to the typical electron flux values as represented by these black dots, we can also gauge the information about the variability of, the flu of these fluxes from one storm to the next. And we can do this by adding the upper and lower quartiles from our statistics to this plot. The quartiles uh, are presented here with error bars and at essentially a measure of how much the flux varies from one storm to the next at a fixed location, energy, and the storm phase. Now, a very interesting thing is that the lower energy fluxes do not appear to vary at all uh, when they are accelerated to a certain point by the end of the main phase of the storm. It seems that the variability at the point when the flux is at their highest is at most a factor of two or three, which is essentially nothing when we are talking about the typical radiation belt variability that can be uh, three or even four orders of magnitude. The variability of the high energy fluxes, however, stays on the same level throughout the whole interval, which includes pre-storm, main phase, and recovery. So a perfectly reasonable question is what can be causing such saturation of flux at the very same level in every single storm? And speaking from my own experience with this data, this result might be simply baffling as you look at it for the first time, as it tells you that the lower energy fluxes reach the same level regardless of the geomagnetic activity or pre-existing flux uh, levels before the storms. And as we can see from these error bars, very large error bars uh, before the storm, that variability is quite large. We know for sure that it is not an instrumentation fault, as the MEGAIS instrument, it's the instrument where we got this energy channel from, um, saturation levels are a bit more than an order of magnitude higher than this level. So the answer is probably in some physics of the radiation belt. And uh, there is a relatively old theory that radiation belts can limit themselves, proposed by Kennel and Patrick in 1966. According to this theory, the radiation belt electrons can increase to a particular level where any additional increases will be balanced out by the loss. In particular, as electron flux levels increase, the new population starts generating chorus waves. Moreover, this chorus wave activity becomes higher as we get more electrons in the belt. Now, these generated chorus waves can cause electrons to precipitate into the atmosphere, which would start depleting the radiation belt. So as we get more particles, 
we get more waves. And as we get more waves, we get fewer particles. So Kennel and Patrick assume that there is supposed to be uh, a certain level at which any increases in the radiation belt would be balanced out by the chorus loss generated by these particles. And this level is commonly referred to as the kennel patrick limit, and it might be a good answer for what we observe in the superposed epoch analysis. However, calculating the limit is a rather challenging task. Moreover, the kennel patrick theory is not commonly spoken about in the space physics community and is largely ignored, so there are not that many papers on this topic. Nonetheless, there is a way of obtaining this limit in terms of the differential flux for both relativistic and non-relativistic particles. Um, and it was introduced by Mock and Fox in 2010. So we can use their method to calculate the canal patch limit for all of our storms. And when we do that, it does seem that the lower particles hit this limit in every storm that we studied. On this plot, which you've seen before from uh, one slide before, I've added the superposed epoch median flux limit in red, uh, shown as a red line. The red shaded region around it is the upper and lower quartiles uh, of the limit uh, across our statistics, and the blue shaded region is the uncertainty of the model, which is typically estimated as a factor of three. Now, the fact that the quartiles of the kennel patchic limit are very small tells us that the limit uh, does not vary that much across different storms, so it essentially creates a hard cap at the same flux level in our events. That level is apparently reached in every storm as evident from the error bars that collapse to a factor of two at most as the fluxes reach the limit. For higher energies, however, the fluxes remain way below the limit and we do not see any changes in the variability of these fluxes. So this result tells us a very interesting thing. It appears that the dynamics of the lower energy population are affected by the presence of the canal patchic limit in essentially every storm that we looked into. The higher energies are typically not affected. However, these are only two energy channels at one fixed L star. Yes, heart of the radiation belt, but still. Uh, so the next question is how far in energy or location uh, does the influence of this canal patch check limit will extend? And for that, we can start looking at the full electron flux spectra as the storm progresses. So these plots uh, now show the superposed epoch electron flux and resulting canal patchic limit in the same, same format as you've seen before, but we plot the flux as a function of energy at three characteristically different times within the storm. During the pre-storm, median flux for levels remain well below the limit with very large variability in each of the energy channels. However, uh, as the storm hits and we enter the recovery phase, we see a rapid increase of the seed electron fluxes with a few hundred uh, kilo electron volts to the kennel patchic limit, at the same time as the variability of the fluxes in those energy channels drops drastically. As the recovery phase continues, we see that the fluxes at even higher energies are enhanced, bringing them closer to the limit and at the same time decreasing the variability of the flux in those energy channels. So these three plots actually tell us that kennel patchic limit influence can extend above relatively low energies and can also affect relativistic populations in your typical storm. So to, illust to illustrate up to what energy this influence extends, we can calculate a correlation between how close the flux to the kennel patchic limit, it's the left plot, with the size of the error bars that represents the variability, is the middle plot. So when the correlation is strongly negative, it means that the error bars get smaller as the flux get closer to the canal patchic limit. And we see this behavior being very pronounced for all energies below approximately 800 kilo electron volts, as shown on the right plot. Moreover, we can extend this analysis beyond only a single L star by repeating all these calculations, all these analysis that we just went through for other uh, locations. And once we do that, we can clearly see that electrons with energies below 800 kilo electron volts located at the heart of the radiation belt that is between L stars of three and a half and five and a half are affected by the presence of the limit in any typical geomagnetic storm of at least moderate intensity. Now, it's important to remind you that these values are obtained from statistical analysis of geomagnetic storms selected based on their DST values only. However, as with any statistics, there are some outliers and there are some extreme cases. A particularly interesting one is where the flux reaches the canal patchic limit at even higher energies. These electron uh, flux energy spectra show the acceleration phase of the October 2016 geomagnetic storm. 
During this event, the 2.6 electron flux was at the highest in the whole of the Van Allen probe era, and even in this case, the flux remains at or below the canal patch limit. Particularly interesting is the fact that energies up to 2 mega electron volts reach the canal patch limit in this storm, but they never surpass it. This extends our possible domain of influence of the canal patch limit up to strongly or even ultra relativistic energies. But if I had to speculate, I would assume that there will be similar behavior at even higher energies. But unfortunately, there are no geomagnetic storms there in the Van Allen probe era that contain stronger acceleration than this one. So it is impossible to say for sure uh, with the current data set. Now, it is also interesting to compare our results to that of Zhang et al. from 2020. In their paper, Zhang looked at the maximum flux measured by the Van Allen probes and proposed that there exists a maximum flux level to electron population. When we compare their results to those during the strongest acceleration period from the last slide, the resemblance is just uncanny. While the location is a bit different for these two plots, it does seem that Zhang's maximum flux limit follows the canal patch check limit uh, up to about 2 MeV. Beyond that, Zhang's limit drops off, while the canal patch check stays at a relatively same level. However, as I already mentioned, uh, this is the strongest acceleration event in the Van Allen probe era. So we cannot say whether the fluxes can increase further to the canal patch limit at even higher energies, as we simply do not have enough of those strong acceleration storms to say for sure. What is even more interesting, however, is when we compare the outputs from the AE8 or AE9 models uh, that are plotted on the Zhang's plot, um, their predicted highest intensity fluxes remain well below either of their limits meaning that even when using models that created uh, that incorporated in themselves the data from uh, previous solar cycles that are much more intense, the resulting worst case scenario of fluxes will be below the theoretical predictions of, for example, the canal patch limit. So this actually brings me to the conclusion slide that summarizes what I've just said. And in short, I just showed that we can expect the canal patch limit to cap the acceleration of, 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 uh, of electrons with energies below uh, 800 kV in essentially every storm. Thus, adding this self-limiting physics in the radiation belt modeling or forecasting would be a very important thing. And it becomes even more important when we're studying the most intense storms with the largest accelerations. And just one more final thought to finish it off. Uh, when one needs to get the information about the worst case scenario radiation levels around the Earth, it appears that the canal patch theory can provide a very good estimation for it. Meanwhile, some of the current state of the art models might underestimate it. So next time, when you want to design a radiation hard satellite or a particle detector that can measure all kinds of radiation around the Earth, I would encourage you to keep the existence of this canal patch limit in mind because this is how bad the space radiation can get. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Kyle, if you're speaking, you're muted. Thank you, Leon, for reminding me about that, and thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, we have time for a few questions, and I have one in the chat from Sam Walton. Um, He's asking if you view the KAP limit as a hard limit, or do the electrons begin to be affected before reaching the limit? Uh, it seems that the error bars gradually reduce as the flux increases. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the error bars do gradually decrease, but it might also be the reason because in some storms, the particles hit in the limit a little bit earlier and in some of them are later. So this cannot be said for sure that it's uh, something that happens in every single storm. It's just a typical behavior and the variability with respect to the pre-storm, uh, with respect to the phase of the storm. Now, in my view, it might work like a hard limit for particles. As soon as they will start hitting it, they will just stay there. But of course, if we will have some other acceleration processes that would act much faster uh, than the coarse waves uh, precipitation would act in the belt, we will see the decreases, uh, the increase in flux uh, a little bit faster, uh, a little bit beyond the canal patch limit. I hope it makes sense. All right. Well, uh, cool. Uh, we have one more, 
where we have a couple more questions. Um, one from Patricia Reef. Um, can you remind us quickly of the physics of the KP limit, the kennel petrek limit? Yes, so uh, I think I skimmed uh, very quickly over it, but the idea is that, here you go. But the idea is that when the particles are uh, accelerated in the radiation belt, as we get more uh, seed electrons, for example, uh, they will start generating the uh, chorus waves. And those chorus waves will start scattering the particles into the loss cone. So as soon as we, uh, Kennel Patrick postulated that there's supposed to be this equilibrium level where any kind of increases will be balanced out by this chorus uh, loss that, generate, that is generated by those waves that are generated by these particles. So it's essentially like a closed loop. More particles, more waves, more waves, less particles, less particles, less particles. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we have a couple more questions, but I'd like to come back to them um, just so that we stay on time for the hour. Um, so we'll address the last couple of questions from Antonova and Jay after Riley's presentation, just in case, uh, just for those that have to leave within the hour. Um, so Riley, if you would like to take the screen and Allison, if you would like to do the introduction, that would be great. And Jay and Antonova, I will come back to your questions for Leon um, after we finish with Riley's. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce Riley. Riley Troyer is a fourth year PhD student here at the University of Iowa in my research group. Um, he is uh, currently the recipient of a NASA Finest Fellowship, which focuses on the drivers and energy of pulsating aurora, which we'll talk about today. And in 2020, he won the AGU Outstanding Student Paper Award. Um, he's gonna tell you about the current work that he's doing, but previous to this work, he had developed a very nice paper on a unique type of auroral emission that in the end we called the diffuse auroral eraser. And it got a fair bit of media attention, so that was great. Uh, he is about to head off on a trip to Alaska to support the LAMP sounding rocket mission. Um, he's gonna help measure different aspects of pulsating aurora and energetic precipitation at a remote downrange field site in Venati, Alaska. Um, he did grow up in Fairbanks, so it won't be too shocking of an, of an experience, I hope. And he is expected to defend his thesis next year. So take it away, Riley. Thanks, Allison. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, the opportunity here to share um, some really interesting results that we have that we are hopefully going to be uh, publishing here or submitting for publication very soon. Um, Though I have been saying that for the past couple months. Uh, but to be fair, uh, as Allison mentioned, we have this uh, LAMP, this rocket mission coming up soon, um, which I have a couple slides at the end of this presentation because it is pertinent sort of to this, this research in particular. Um, uh, but before that, uh, we'll talk about uh, this research, which uh, is about uh, the energy of a particular type of aurora known as pulsating aurora. Uh, and so I know pulsating aurora has been mentioned a few times on this seminar series before, but I figured I'd spend a couple slides just to uh, explain it in a little more detail. Uh, so unlike the your typical bright green curtains of discrete aurora, uh, pulsating aurora are an entirely different uh, type. They often occur after magnetic midnight. And when they do, they look sort of like this video here, these uh, dim, uh, barely visible to the naked eye. There are patches and blobs of auroral light that will blink on and off. Uh, and each of these, these patches can be remarkably varied, both like size, shape, and as well as the, the periods that they flash at. Uh, and so despite kind of the more, I guess, diffuse and, and subdued uh, look of pulsating aurora, uh, we, we think that they are very important to how the magnetosphere and the atmosphere uh, sort of coupled together and how energy is transferred between the two. And so there's a few reasons for that, um, which I'll, I'll show this uh, video here. You can watch some more examples of pulsating aurora uh, while I talk about those. So the first is because pulsating aurora are extremely common. Uh, so pretty much any night you have some sort of auroral activity, you're also gonna have pulsating aurora. And so when pulsating aurora occurs, as you can see in this, uh, 
mosaic from the Themis cameras, they can be uh, very widespread across the large portions of the auroral region, um, multiple hours of MLT. And when they do happen, they also uh, tend to stick around for quite a while. Uh, so I think the average time for a pulsating aurora event is around an hour and a half or so, but they can extend well beyond that. Uh, this particular uh, sort of case study from this Jones et al. paper uh, was, I believe, basically it lasted uh, all night, like many hours at a time. And so when you combine uh, all those together with this last point, um, this is kind of the last nail in the coffer for why, why they're so important, and that is the uh, the energy involved with uh, pulsating aurora. So the energy of the electrons that cause pulsating aurora, unlike discrete aurora, are uh, quite a bit more energetic. And that's because they these electrons originate out in the um, uh, Van Allen radiation belt. And this is actually a, a great transition from uh, Leon's talk because he, he mentioned how coarse waves can cause this precipitation of electrons from the radiation belt into the atmosphere. And one effect of that precipitation is pulsating aurora. And so because of that, the energies involved with pulsating aurora range usually between tens to hundreds of keV, uh, though there has been some evidence that you can actually have uh, MeV particles uh, associated with this. And that's sort of in relation to more discrete aurora, which typically ranges uh, up to maybe 10 keV. So it can be an order of magnitude more energetic. And so you combine how high energy these events are with how common they are, how wide, widespread they can be, and how persistent. Uh, you start to get a, a sense of, of just how much energy transfer they represent into the atmosphere and how important they can be uh, between that coupling between the magnetosphere and the atmosphere. So one particular effect of this, uh, this interaction uh, and how it can affect the atmosphere is through the reduction of ozone. Uh, so when these higher energy particles enter the atmosphere, uh, they collide, collide with molecules there and in those collisions can produce these NOx particles. And NOx, NOx particles have the ability to uh, basically react with ozone and deplete it from the atmosphere. So these extremely high energy particles, uh, uh, sometimes if they're high enough energy, they can actually reach all the way down to basically the ozone layer and produce the NOx particles there and thus reduce ozone. But even the uh, slightly less energetic ones will produce the NOx at a, a little higher altitude and then through a variety of uh, atmospheric convection and processes can actually work its way down to the ozone layer and again, uh, reduce the ozone. And so this is still a fairly new uh, topic of research, but uh, some recent work like this Veronin at all paper from last year uh, found that uh, pulsating aurora energetic electron precipitation can have a measurable impact on ozone concentration above 30 kilometer altitude with ozone depletion by up to 8% seen in winter periods. Uh, so I'm not like an atmospheric chemist or anything like that, but you know, nearly an 8 or 10% uh, reduction in ozone seems fairly significant to me uh, and something that's definitely worth understanding it in greater detail. And so because of that, we believe that uh, really classifying and understanding the energy of pulsating aurora and how it can vary uh, is important. So to do that, we decided to construct, construct a, a large statistical study using this device here known as the poker flat incoherent scatter radar. So the way these uh, incoherent scatter radars work is essentially sending a uh, pulses of radio emission up into the atmosphere. That radio emission then scatters off of ions, uh, up in the ionosphere, and the uh, instrument can measure that very faint backscattered signal. And from that, deduce a variety of, of metrics about the atmosphere. The one in particular that we are interested in is the electron density. Uh, so there's an example of some of this data here on the right, where the color is electron density, the y-axis is altitude, uh, and then the x-axis is time. Uh, so we did a whole bunch of sleuthing looking through uh, many days of imager data from this, this same location where this, this radar is, as well as looking through the radar data and came up with a, uh, a large data set of pulsating aurora events this, this, that this radar uh, was measuring data during. And so you'll be unsurprised to see that this example data here is one such event out of the 57 total that we found. 
Um, and so this event is actually a, a good representation of what we, we see happening during these pulsating aurora events. And that's, you can see right at the onset of pulsating aurora, marked by the uh, dashed red line there, you can actually see that this uh, electron density uh, sort of shifts or pushes to lower altitudes, which is an indication of higher energy particles entering the atmosphere as those particles can, can reach further down. And so using just the, the electron density, we can actually extract an estimate of the, the full uh, energy spectra. Um, but that is, and we, we did that, and I'll talk about that in a few slides, but it is a fairly in-depth process. So to start with, we kind of wanted to get a sense of what the data was doing with more of a proxy for the energy. And for that proxy, we chose this altitude boundary that I've kind of sketched out in red here. And that is the boundary or the boundary that the lowest altitude that there was a, an electron density of at least 10 to the 10th in this uh, uh, data here from the, the radar. So we found that boundary for every one minute slice of data for every all of the 57 pulsating aurora events that we had. And then we plotted uh, each of those altitude values versus uh, several metrics. Uh, so the plot here on the left is plotting at that altitude, altitude again on the y-axis versus magnetic local time. Uh, so remember though, the lower the altitude is, um, that's sort of a proxy for higher energy. And so if you look at the magnetic local time, uh, you can see so there is some variability and it looks like there might be some sort of, maybe a, a little bit of a dip after magnetic midnight here around maybe two to four MLT. Uh, but our data isn't really spread that well in magnetic local time. Uh, you can see some of the sort of bins here, the data gets a little uh, scarce. Um, so we don't really want to say too much regarding that. Uh, there has been some previous studies that have shown a, a decrease in this time period, um, but our data doesn't show that super well. However, it, when we turn now to plotting versus the other two indices we have here, uh, there is a, a much stronger pattern. Uh, so in the middle plot, we've now plotted the same data, but now versus the minutes that the data was taken after a substorm onset. So sort of the temporal proximity to a substorm. And then the far right plot is versus AE indices. And so uh, what you can really see here is that both closer to the start of a substorm as well for and higher AE indices uh, make it much more likely that this altitude boundary will be at a lower altitude. Uh, indicating higher energy particles. And so now if we take this uh, kind of as a final thing here, if we take this middle plot, plot B, and clear all of the scatter points based on AE indices, we get this plot here, uh, which is just is showing basically that both the temporal proximity to a substorm as well as the AE index uh, can both vary this proxy for uh, energy. Uh, and like I mentioned, again, this is just a proxy for energy, and we're really interested in, in getting some actual energy values out of this. And to do that, we have to solve what is known as uh, an inverted problem. So essentially, we model some sort of uh, electron flux here, and then uh, see what sort of electron density response that modeled flux would have in the atmosphere, and find the the model that that best matches the Pfizer data. Um, and so we did that for every single one of our, our, our data points. Um, but the issue with a inversion process like this is that it's known as what's kind of ill-defined, meaning that there are multiple uh, energy fluxes that could result in a good enough fit to our data. And so because of that, we weren't really confident in more of the fine scale structure and shape of each of the, the energy spectra. Uh, so to mitigate the error associated with that, we instead chose a uh, threshold value, in this case, 30 keV, and integrated each of the spectra uh, to the left of that and to the right of that to get uh, a low energy portion of the spectrum and a high energy portion of the spectrum. And we did that again for each of the, uh, the data points we had and plotted that uh, versus some uh, statistical bins, which I have here sort of in our, our main takeaway plot from this research. So in this plot, the y-axis is energy flux. And the x-axis, there are 
uh, several bins in both of these uh, metrics, the temporal proximity from a substorm and the AE index. And so in each of those bins, uh, there are two bars and the total height of both stacks stacked bars combined represents the total energy flux or the average total energy flux for all of our data in that particular bin. Um, and the height of the uh, solid blue bar represents the contribution to that total flux from these higher energy particles. While the uh, dashed uh, green bar represents the contribution from the lower energy, the less than 30 keV electrons. And so when you look at this, it becomes immediately obvious that for these higher AE indices and closer to the start of a substorm, you get this increase in total uh, energy flux. So more energy close to the start of a substorm and for higher AE indices. And you can also see that uh, if, in addition to both the total energy flux increasing, the contribution from these, these higher energy particles greater than 30 keV also increases. Uh, so an indication basically that the spectra is hardening for these periods. Uh, so this plot here is using a threshold value of 30 keV. We also did the same thing for a threshold value of 50 keV and 100 keV. And while the, uh, the values changed obviously a little bit, the relative behavior between all of those was the same with this increase uh, for higher AE index and uh, closer to the start of a substorm. So with a plot like this, it kind of begs the question, you know, what might be causing uh, behavior like this? And I'll warn you, this is all basically just speculation uh, on my part at this point. We haven't done any real official work in this. It's just me piecing together things uh, from the literature. Uh, but one possible cause of this could be this uh, whistler mode waves that are driven by substorms. So it's known that substorms can drive uh, these whistler mode waves. And it's also known that lower band chorus waves, uh, which are a, a type of Whistler mode wave in the uh, outer radiation belt uh, can cause these uh, radiation belt particles to precipitate and cause pulsating aurora. So could it be, uh, could this data be a, a representation of these uh, substorm driven Whistler mode waves uh, causing pulsating aurora? Uh, kind of one last piece of evidence uh, perhaps uh, indicating that is if you look at our, our sort of takeaway plot here again, and this uh, temporal proximity to a substorm uh, section, you notice that closer to the start of a substorm, the total energy raises fairly consistently, but that the uh, actual uh, contribution from the higher energy particles remains pretty consistent out to about an hour. And then after an hour, it drops off significantly. Um, that's interesting because that time scale also corresponds fairly well to uh, this paper, uh, Meredith et al. 2000, um, that one found that uh, uh, substorms could drive these Whistler mode waves and that these Whistler mode waves in the region of the outer radiation belt decayed with, with a time scale of about an hour. Uh, so perhaps this is, is a reason for this drop off we see in our data, but again, uh, haven't done any actual additional work on that, um, but that would be interesting to do. Uh, so what, what comes next for this work after this? Um, well, first and foremost, we're looking to, to publish uh, and getting that out soon, but uh, even sooner, um, coming up here in only a couple of weeks, we have this uh, rocket mission, the Lost Through Overall Microburst Pulsations mission uh, that both Alice and I will be heading up to. And so for this mission, we're going to be launching a rocket into a, a uh, period of pulsating aurora. The rocket will be equipped with instruments capable of measuring a very wide range of energies up to MEV particles. And uh, then we're combining that with a slew of, of cameras on the ground capable of measuring uh, at quite high frame rates, up to like 100 frames per second. And so the reason for that is that this particular mission is uh, looking at trying to find the if there is any relation between what's known as microbursts, which are these very short, fast uh, increases in the, the electron flux that are seen both uh, in the atmosphere as well as out in the radiation belt, and trying to determine if they have, or in, in any way responsible for pulsating aurora and the three hertz flicker of pulsating aurora, 
Uh, so I didn't mention it before, but sometimes the patches of pulsating aurora can, if you have a fast enough camera, you can actually see them flickering at a, a, a three hertz rate. And then finally, the LAMP mission is, is investigating whether there's a high energy tail component of pulsating aurora uh, and whether that is related to these higher energy microbursts that are seen in the radiation belt. And so obviously that last point, to have the best uh, mission that we can, we'd like to launch into a, uh, a time of pulsating aurora that has the, the highest energy that we can find. Uh, and so with this work that we've been working on now, we've been able to uh, have a launch criteria related to substorms and be uh, fairly confident that if we're able to launch just after into a pulsating aurora event that occurred just after a substorm, uh, and if the uh, AE index is uh, relatively high, that we should be pretty confident that we'll see these higher energy particles. Um, so finally, just sort of uh, summing up uh, this presentation here, uh, we have shown for the first time a statistical correlation between substorm strength and timing and pulsating aurora energies. So more energetic events occur soon after substorms and for higher AE indices. And finally, these results will assist the upcoming LAMP rocket mission. So that's everything I have. If you're interested in following along with our mission, uh, our official website is here. We'll be updating it uh, somewhat frequently throughout the, uh, the launch. Thanks. All right, thank you for a wonderful talk, Riley. Um, we have a few um, questions, um, but first of all, I'd like to thank our speakers for the first set of early career seminars and for nicely putting stuff together that actually goes hand in hand. Um, and hopefully I'll have a bit of time to ask a question regarding that. Um, so our first question for Riley uh, comes from Jason Durr. Um, have you looked at the lower altitude boundary for some chunk of time prior to substorm onset as well? Um, so I guess we have, um, we, we basically just looked at the data for pulsating aurora events. And so, um, yeah, I did not look, I guess I didn't, I basically, the that that plot I have, if I can go back to it, of, here we go, of this here from time after a substorm. Yeah, I did not include like a negative time, I guess you could say, uh, before substorm. Um, that would be, I guess, interesting to see, but I did not do that. Okay. Um, so our next question comes from Judy Carpin. Um, what does the pulsation period tell us about the underlying mechanism? Um, is there a wavelet analysis or some sort of analysis that you can do to look at the pulsation period? Yeah, that is uh, tricky. And there's some other works that our group is doing to try and really classify that. It gets, it, it gets a little hard. Um, so this three hertz flicker that I mentioned, um, that corresponds pretty well to like the frequency of these microbursts. Um, so there is a relation there. Uh, there also has been some, some studies relating uh, modulated chorus waves um, measured from a variety of different satellites out in, in the radiation belt to uh, frequencies in pulsating aurora. Uh, so there is some evidence that the pulsations may be related to those mo modulated chorus waves. Uh, it does get really tricky to try and do any sort of wide like more statistical study of the pulsating periods just because uh, oftentimes you can't really follow one particular patch as it pulse, pulses on and off. Um, and uh, just because of the nature of pulsating aurora, that's a lot of the pulsating aurora doesn't have specific one patch that you can really follow. Uh, but then also it gets hard. You have to have a, uh, a camera that's capable of, of resolving the uh, temporal variability and the, the pulsations. Um, so a lot of the cameras we use, like the Themis camera, I think takes in uh, once every three seconds, I believe, image, um, which, you know, granted, if the periods are greater than, than three seconds, you should be able to catch. But uh, oftentimes, you can have pulsating periods that are less than that as well. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so we have one question from uh, dog again. Uh, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, are the emissions from the pulsating aurora too small to be using GLOW to model 
them to further the energy limit and energy flux and an average energy? Uh, so I guess I'm not familiar with GLOW. Um, I feel like I may have heard that in some presentations, but uh, I can't say uh, further. Um, so I have a final question. Um, these works seem to go nicely hand in hand and are quite complementary. Um, your supervisor, Allison, has done a lot of work on storms and about the acceleration being driven um, by enhanced particles during or by an injection of particles during substorms. Do you guys have any plans to look at a similar statistical analysis of these pulsating aurora and the energy limits during the recovery phase of storms when Leon seems, or when Leon is suggesting that you might be seeing enhanced coarse wave power? Yeah, so Allison can touch on that as well, but I do believe uh, some of the work that I'll be doing kind of following up on this for the rest of my thesis gets a little closer to that. And I believe she has some other students as well that are working on, on similar stuff. Um, so we have another question. Um, so sorry, thank you, Riley. Um, we have another question from Stephen. Um, can you get each discrete frequency of each pulsating aurora? Um, so this is relating to Judy's question. Um, I think you touched on it, uh, that sometimes the frequency is too high in the all sky imagers or the resolution is too long to actually get the full frequency. Yeah, that's, it, it can be really tricky. Um, just the nature of pulsating aurora because the patches that will be next to each other can can often pulse at different periods. Um, and those periods often don't necessarily align with the what the cameras are capable and their exposures. Um, we are actually doing some work that we hope might eventually uh, allow us to do this in a larger statistical sense with some machine learning algorithms to detect pulsating aurora. And we're hoping we may be able to work some sort of like temporal uh, identification into there as well, but. Uh, it's definitely a tricky problem and, and something that we are thinking about, but uh, it's definitely uh, a work in progress. Yeah, yeah, it becomes quite difficult when you start working with images and trying to do image processing instead of just time series analysis. Um, so we have one more question from Ian. Um, there's an interesting study by Humberset et al. 2018, which show that there is a persistent repeating 2D spatial shape in pulsating aurora from pulse to pulse. Uh, in that paper, they assumed that meant cold plasma must be important for modulating the emission. Um, does your analysis offer any further insight into this and what might be modulating the emission? Yeah, I guess I don't... I'd have to look at that paper to see for sure. Um, so the, at least the way I've, I've understood, there's been some, some work that seems to indicate that the like modulation, the emission modulation is due to potentially these modulated chorus waves out in the radiation belt, kicking like particles into the atmosphere and, and some sort of like the semi-periodic way that corresponds well to the uh, uh, modulations. As far as the uh, the spatial aspect, uh, yeah, I couldn't couldn't say, and I'm not sure. I have some some stuff, yeah, regarding like atmospheric density, and I think that's still a very open question on why pulsating aurora shapes are shaped the way they are, and and why the pulsations behave the way they do. Excellent. Uh, so thank you, Riley. Um, uh, if we have more questions, I can come back. Um, but I will jump back to Leon's talk. Um, Leon, if you're available, we have a few more questions. Uh, the first one comes from Elizaveta. Um, how is your approach uh, similar to the uh, Tever Teverskaya relation and processes during large storms? All right, uh, thank you. So uh, do you think I can share my screen again? Absolutely. So <clears throat> I will answer a portion of this question first. So during the most intense storms, I showed this slide where we have the largest acceleration uh, up to 2 MeV, and it does seem that the Kennel Apache limit and the electron fluxes line up pretty well. 
Now, um, if I do not mistake, the relation that you're talking about is about the location where the po relativistic particles are being injected. And the short answer is I'm not sure how exactly they relate to our results, simply because, uh, well, any kind of uh, process, would it be acceleration by waves or would it be an injection that can bring particles to the canal patchic limit can do that but the existence of the limit itself uh, doesn't really depend on the process that brought those particles to that limit. I hope it makes sense. Um, so our next question is from Jay. Um, I believe it's Jay Albert. Um, have you looked at how long the fluxes remain at their peaks? Yes. Uh, so from just, just, just by looking at the superposed epoch analysis, um, I guess this one will be easier to explain. Uh, the lower energy particles remain at the limit, which is within like the uncertainty of the model or a factor of three for about one day after the maximum is reached. Then if we will start looking at the higher energy and the more intense storms, like the one that I showed here uh, for October, 2016, uh, it really varies and depends on the storm, uh, whether we will encounter, let's say, a second compound event right after this one that will decrease uh, the belt or it will it can stay there for additional time. So the short answer, it varies, but on average, about a day. Um, so we have a comment and a cautionary suggestion from David Pitchford. Um, he says, very nice presentation. Uh, one comment regarding the AE8 model uh, is that it's supposed to give a good average of the electron flux over a long period, such as a solar cycle. Uh, so it might be difficult to apply or compare to individual or superposed epoch events. Yes, 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 which I fully agree with. And the last question uh, comes from Jason Durr. Um, can you imagine a mechanism that might might eliminate the kennel pecheck limit by reducing the effective production of chorus waves? Uh, so that's a, actually a great question. Um, so eliminate, it's probably not gonna happen. It will still be there, but maybe it will be a little bit higher. So it will allow particles to accelerate for longer before hitting this limit in those conditions. We can get that for, for example, in the, in the conditions where the chorus wave generation, for example, is impeded, uh, like uh, higher cold plasma density, for example. Now, um, what I can say for sure is based on our statistics, it doesn't seem that the kennel patch check varies that much across different storms. But I'm pretty sure that if we will dig deep enough into the data from the Van Allen probe era, we can find when the kennel patchic limit is at its highest as well, just based purely on the geomagnetic conditions during that particular storm. Okay. Um, and I think we have one more question for Riley, um, again from Judy. Uh, why don't all auroras pulsate? Yeah, so I, I tried to answer this to her as well in the chat, but uh, I think there's it, mainly because so pulsating aurora is this special uh, mechanism that's different than other types of aurora, like the discrete aurora. Um, and I think some of the research really is just trying to figure out why exactly it, it does pulsate, but discrete aurora is a different process that doesn't have as much of that similar temporal uh, variation um, that causes the pulsations, uh, at least the way I understand it. I don't, don't know the mechanism behind discrete aurora quite as well as pulsating aurora, but um, it's typically caused by these parallel electric fields that accelerate the uh, electrons in. And uh, my guess is you just don't have as much variation in those in the same sort of time scales. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so we have a final comment question from Jason, um, which is, I guess, a little bit more of a discussion point between the two talks. I wonder if events observed closer to the KP limit would be more likely to result in pulsating aurora emissions since events closer to the KP limit have a larger available flux of higher energy electrons, which would then be potentially lost by the coarse Whistler emission mechanism. Yeah, I was so, thinking about this I, as well during um, uh, Leon's talk and that would be my guess because my guess would be the more chorus emission you have, the uh, more likely you're going to get uh, 
the enough particle precipitation to cause pulsating aurora uh, will be really interesting to look at, compare the two data sets. Anything else to add, Leon? I agree. <laughs> yeah. It does right. sound like a very interesting study that we can check. Uh, but yes, I think Ian Excellent. in the chat also added a very good uh, comment towards that. So yes, I will not be mm -hmm. accurate that. Well, thank you both for wonderful talks and for kicking off our early career seminar series. Um, it was great to have you guys here. Uh, the talk is now up on YouTube. Um, next week, we will have Mei Ching Fock, and she will be discussing the CME simula simulation. Uh, the week after that, we will have a break. And following that, we will have our first Python tutorial, an introduction to Python. Uh, so I hope to see you all for the rest of February, and I hope everyone has a wonderful week. Thank you. Bye-bye.